Howdy, folks, and welcome back to another edition of Prague Watch. I want to thank you all for coming along for the ride. I've got something a little bit different lined up for this week. A few weeks ago, I made a connection with Simon Godfrey. He's been in a number of bands, including Shineback and Tiny Fish, and he's put out a number of records on his own as Simon Godfrey. And uh, he's also the brother of the English producer and instrumentalist Jem Godfrey, who uh, those of you who are fans of Frost will know Jem's name very well. So anyway, I was able to sit down and have a little chat with uh, Simon. He was feeling a little under the weather at the time, but he soldiered on. So I'm going to go ahead and play some of that, and we're going to be playing some uh, music from his various projects, Tiny Fish, Shine Back, and his solo work. And I'm going to let it rip now. All right, so I have with me today Simon Godfrey, who has been in bands such as Tiny Fish, Shine Back, and now he's embarking on some solo stuff here. And Simon isn't feeling real well today, but he has decided to soldier on and provide this interview. <laughs> so I appreciate it very much. So yeah, if he has a, a little cough here or there, uh, forgive him, folks. It'll so, be the laughter that will set me into the coughing, trust me. Simon uh, is known to have a bit of a sense of humor and not take himself too seriously for those of you out there who aren't familiar too much with his work. But if I, hope... I am the anti-Stephen Wilson. <laughs> he said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I get what you say about Wilson. I mean, you never see the guy smile, really. You know? Well, to be to be really honest with you, I was uh, back in the UK um, uh, a couple of months ago, and I was lucky enough to see him play at the, uh, the Royal Albert Hall, and he was very humorous between the songs. Um, was he? Uh, yeah, he was an extremely good uh, um, front man, and uh, he kept the crowd entertained. I think he he really has sort of like hit that mark where his songs and his subject matters are very serious, and you know he treats his his music seriously. But uh, you know he he likes to be uh, uh, at least a little warm and, and light hearted in between the songs because who wants to be unremittingly depressing? Right, right, exactly. Um... For those of you who don't know, Simon is from the UK, but now he resides in Philadelphia. Yay, go Phillies! Oh no, I'm from Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> we we don't like Philly, uh, <laughs> except for you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know. I, I I've uh, I've quickly come to the realization that uh, uh, the world hates the Eagles, um, which uh, the the football team, not the band. Right, right. Add here, so. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, but the bottom line here is that uh, I'm not a huge uh, football fan. I'm uh, very, very much a baseball fan, though. Okay, how about hockey? Hockey, I go see the Flyers. Uh, I, I probably catch them maybe about two or three times a season where, when the uh, when money and time allows, really. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm suffering through the Penguins not being too hot right now. Uh, yeah, it's uh, to be really honest with you, I personally think that when your team isn't doing, it's very easy to support a team that's winning. It's when they're not winning that they need your support, really. Right, right. That's what my wife says. How come you're watching them? They stink. Well, yeah, they stink right now, but that's that's. I'm a diehard. I've been watching them since <laughs> I was a kid, you know? Well, good on you, sir. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, I guess, you know, maybe we should get people a little more familiar with your work here. Yeah. Um, that's kind of the point. Um, so, uh you want to talk a little bit about where you've been, what you've what you've done, where you know where you are now? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I started um, I started life actually. Funnily enough, uh, uh, for, for the first ten years of my musical career, I, I played drums. Okay. Uh, I was the drummer in a band called Free Fall, which uh, contained uh, myself, a guy called Jim Sanders on guitar, uh, a bass player called. Uh, Paul Woolward on bass, and my brother, Jem Godfrey, on keyboards, who is now the keyboard player and principal songwriter in the band called Frost. Frost, of course. Yes, I've played them on the show. There we are then. Um, and then um, uh, I took a break from uh, progressive music uh, for about 10 years, funnily enough, actually, and then I was lured back in um, uh, after I was doing I was doing a session um, for, a, for another musician, uh, and one of the other session uh uh, musicians in that band was uh, was in a progressive rock band called Landmark. That was the bass player called Steve G. And Landmark are uh, uh, quite a, a, a big and, and well-known band in the UK for progressive music. And he kind of reintroduced me to the scene. And uh, um, as, a, as a result, I, I went out and bought what I thought were the, the people that were worth listening to at the time. I went and bought myself, I think, a little bit of Flower Kings. I bought some early Stephen Wilson stuff, some some from the Delirium years. And uh, and funnily enough, I actually bought the first album uh, by Spock's Beard, The Light. 
And those were my three sort of like, I thought I covered a big base of music in progressive rock. And that kind of got me back into it, which uh, led me to form uh, a band called Tiny Fish with ex free fall guy Jim Sanders on guitar and Paul Warwood on bass, <clears throat> along with a, a gentleman called Robert Ramsey, who was our, our lyricist, but also did a kind of strange thing that, that maybe not a lot of bands do, which he would do. If you remember, Peter Gabriel would do these strange soliloquies yes, uh, yes. in the numbers back during the days when he was with Genesis. Uh, Rob Ramsey um, would, would kind of do something similar and he would walk out on stage with these very strange costumes and, and deliver these these little spoken word sequences between the songs. And sometimes, after a little while, we realised we could incorporate his speaking, uh, his spoken word sections actually into the songs themselves. So we were in that band along with a drummer called Leon Campbell for about five years. Um, and then um, around about uh, the end of 2013... Um, I met my wife, who is a, uh, a native Philadelphian, and decided to move from the UK to the US. And now I'm now resident here full time. And I have a new band now with um, a guy called uh, Joe Cardillo, who's on keyboards, and a gentleman called Tom Hyatt, who is the bass player in a band called Echolin. Okay, hey, yeah, I know Echolin. We've played yeah. them here too. Oh yeah. well, there we go then. And yeah. uh, we're, we're we're currently um, we've been using a number of of drummers uh, for live shows, and I play a little bit of drums still myself. But um, we're uh, we're in the process of uh, sorting out a, a new drummer to, to flesh out that lineup. And that band is called Valdez, and we should hopefully be releasing uh, an album sometime over the summer of next year. Great! I can't wait to hear that. Um, so so where did the whole Shine Back thing fit in there? Well, Shineback was the project that I immediately took up uh, the reins of after um, Tiny Fish uh, laid down uh, to rest, so to speak. So so that's done then, I suppose. Yeah, to, well, I mean, to be honest with you, I always like to say never say never. I don't like shutting doors. Sure. And they are, they all of these guys, Jim and Paul and Rob, they were the guys that I, I've known for years. And they're very good friends of mine. And uh, none of us particularly wanted to uh, to see that band um fall by the wayside but jim is now resident in sweden i am now resident in the u.s and it, it was just you know too logistically too difficult to carry that band on so right. uh, we all decided to bow out gracefully on a high so to speak and uh as such that's what i uh, decided to do i decided to pick up shine back um as a uh, a project with both myself and lyricist rob ramsey and we took that into a slightly different direction. We took that into a, a much more sort of high-tech, electronic, um, uh, combining electronica with, with, with live drums and live guitars and live bass. Yeah, it seems a bit more proggy maybe than some of the Tiny Fish. i got to say, you write a catchy song for sure, man. You know, oh, thank you very much. Some of the Tiny Fish stuff was, you know, I don't know if I'd say it was the proggiest, but there were prog elements, but it was, it was always like really catchy you know you, you you've got a good way with uh you know a good melody and stuff and i never you know i never uh one of my ex-co-hosts used to kind of get on bands that 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 would make like the pop prog stuff and i'm like no man you can't you can't <laughs> criticize that these guys got to pay the bills too you know well it was do you know i have i have to say that um as is often with many bands uh you'll find that there are members within uh, each of the band, which which have particular tastes and particular desires. Myself, uh, our drummer, Leon Canfield, and Rob Ramsey had slightly more esoteric and more progressive leanings, whereas Jim Sanders and and Paul Ward, while they, while they loved a lot of progressive music, liked to um, to hear a song um, at, at the core of any, of any tune that we wrote. And, and being a band, it's a collaborative and a, de and a democratic process, and even though I I tended to uh, to come up with a lot of the or the original ideas for the uh, for the songs. They would flesh it out, and uh, and you you want to listen to every member of the band. So we we kind of tone the progressive elements down a bit because uh, we didn't want to alienate alienate um, two fifths of the band. To be really honest with you, sure. I always said I've been in a few in my day. N nothing even nearing what you're doing, <laughs> you know. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's like being married to three or four other guys. You know, it really is almost like a marriage. You know, when you're exactly in a band. Exactly right, yeah. And, uh, and, and all marriages, any, any marriage has compromises. Give and take, and, uh, right. 
and we we got on like a house on fire it was a very very good band to be in and you know and i miss them very much because uh the chemistry in in a band i think is a is an incredibly important thing i mean you i've been in bands where where people are excellent players and there's they you know they've got chops falling out of their fingers left right and center but the chemistry wasn't there and it was never right. as a as, as satisfying when you're sitting in a rehearsal room or a writing room as when you are when you like somebody and you respect what they they do and uh, and as a result that was one of the reasons which i think kept tiny fish together for though for those seven years that we were together it was a, it was a very enjoyable experience Voyage 35 Prague Radio. So if I wanted to, here, you can like kind of help me program the show, actually, on, on which I'm <laughs> okay. going to do them. If you, if you were going to pick one Tiny Fish song that you thought really summed up the essence of that band, um, can you think of one off the top of your head? Yeah, I would say, uh, I would say Motorville probably is the one track that I think sums up um, uh, Tiny Fish, really, uh, as, as a unit. It was actually the first track. Uh, from the very first album, the eponymous uh, album Tiny Fish, and uh, it has just about everything that that Tiny Fish wanted to do um, uh, as a band, and it, it kind of formed the template of um, of the music that we would that we made from that moment on. And uh, it, even though it is uh, an early track, I'm still very proud of that track because we all contributed to it equally, and and it was um, it was it was a track that. That couldn't have arrived uh, in the world without without all of us working on it. All right. Well, uh, you know what? I think at this point in the show, I think we will go ahead and play that track right now.
So um, yeah, so that the, the song Motorville was really the uh, the beginning of Tiny Fish and uh, and kind of set a blueprint uh, for for what that band was going to do from from that moment in. Uh, it's a, it's a great track. You want to talk a little bit about Shineback at this point? Uh, a little yeah, Shineback is um, Shineback was was something which uh, kind of uh, be- uh, you know made it out into the world uh, because uh, of I have a huge. Uh, backlog of, of, of material um, that never made it really to the light of day. And uh, Shineback was uh, a mixture of, of, of songs which just didn't really feel like the, it was right to introduce that to the Tiny Fish world. It was much more electronic. I mean, my my, my big love is I, I do love a lot of electronic music, and I'm, I'm talking like spanning everywhere back from the sort of... Um, Terry Riley, uh, Rainbow and Curved Air, Wendy Carlos, early sort of like sixties okay, yeah. stuff, Hooked on Bark, all the way through yeah, to yeah. the uh, the sort of like the Tangerine Dream and the Craftwork, uh, Craftwork, yeah. and uh, Jean Michel Jarre, yeah, you cool. know, all the way through to uh, uh, bands like um, Depeche Mode and uh, and upwards onto Apex Twin and Square Pusher as well. I, I one of the things which always drew me to progressive rock was. Um, I loved the fact that, uh, especially during the 70s, uh, progressive bands were very, very much at the cutting edge of technology. These were the guys that were using the Mini Moogs. These were the guys that were using the Mellotrons. These sure. were the guys that were using all of this great technology. Um, I was I was trying I, to explain some craft work to my son, and it's uh, I was trying to tell him, you know what, when they were doing this, there were no electronic drums, you know, yeah, so mean, much they, of it has just become, there weren't sequences, you know, they, these people were inventing this stuff back then. So you kind of have to listen to it in that light these days. Exactly right. And once you know uh, of them in that context, you, you realize exactly how groundbreaking they were. And of course, you know, in a lot of ways, they became almost like the, uh, the unwitting uh, godfathers of, uh, of the, uh, the techno scene as well in Detroit, where they started, Mixing some of the uh, the craft work stuff with some of the uh, the samples and, and soul uh, that they had, um, you've got an entirely new genre even out of that as well. Right, very interesting. <laughs> Regards to Shineback, what I was trying to do, and and this this is going to sound like a very um, this is a very simplified um, summation of what I wanted to do in Shineback, but I effectively wanted to try and make progressive music with. Uh, modern electronic instruments and blend that with some of the traditional stuff and um and out of that came the the shineback project which uh, myself and uh rob ramsey uh, my lyricist co-writer authored and we created an album called um rise up forgotten return destroyed which was a kind of story album which uh which followed a, a young girl it's actually a very dark uh story it was a, a, about a, a young girl who was having uh, well, it was a young woman who was having real problems with sleeping, and uh, and then it, it takes on a slightly more surreal uh, twist when she uh, what she's uh, she's given some advice by her, uh, and I, and I use this inverted in inverted commas um, her therapist <laughs> says, well, why don't you imagine taking a video camera into your dreams and recording what you see? And the story effectively follows Dora as she goes into her dream world and effectively discovers um, what's been happening on in her past life, these, these buried memories. And uh, this is all very subjective. I'm, there's, not, there's no science involved in this, uh, in this idea at all. But uh, this idea that um, uh, she, uh, she came from, a, uh, from an abusive family and, uh, and, and then it goes into this very dark and complex world uh, and it was actually based upon uh some of the troubles that dora had on one of my friends who i won't mention their specifically their name but um they uh, lived for, for years um thinking that uh um that their uncle was their uncle when it turned out many years later they found out that it was their father Oh, and yeah. uh, and i used this kind of as a blueprint for uh, for the hapless uh, character of dora and uh, and 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 basically about her mental breakdown and when she eventually returns from the dream world in which uh, she meets some very fantastical creatures um some uh more human than others she uh, she goes back and wreaks vengeance uh, upon um 
her father and uh, and basically it just it just is a tale about uh, about the unraveling of a of, of one person's um psyche um and it was a it was a very challenging um album to write but an incredibly satisfying one to see uh, make see the light of day because um these are the i always remember i was having some issues about uh, the idea of the the abuse of a child and whether or not i should actually have that as you know, for entertainment purposes, right. if you will, yeah. Yeah. Uh, by putting it on a record. And um, I was having a conversation with um, with a guy called David Longdon, who is ah, the lead singer, singer in a band big called Train. Big, big Train. Right. Yeah. right. And, uh, and he said, well, you should never be afraid to shine a light into dark corners. That's and, a great uh, quote. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that was a very, that really sort of like hit home to me. And he's absolutely right. These are, these are stories, and uh, and if you can come to terms with uh, with some of the darker elements of human nature in such a fashion, it allows us all to examine them uh, and maybe come uh, come to terms and maybe be at peace with them afterwards. Because I think you know, into every life, a little rain must fall, and uh, we all have some darkness in our world, and uh, and we should not be afraid to shine a light on into those dark areas, and. Uh, so David's uh, quote really sort of like um, paid off and, and, and served as the motivation to, to really see the story through and, and make the album happen. Oh, it's a great piece of work. I really enjoy it. I'd, and uh, here on the show, I, th- I was really thinking that maybe I would end up playing the title cut, Rise Up Forgotten. Return okay, Destroyed. yeah, well, it's it, it certainly, I mean, I, I love that track. It, it's um, it's it's possibly the, the most representative track on the album. Well, then we're going to play it, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, go ahead and tell us why. Yeah. I don't want to interrupt you. Go ahead and tell us why. No, I, I would just say the reason being is that uh, um, the, the, the title track is about 12 minutes long, and it's um, it, I, I threw just about every trick I could possibly th- think of into that song, arrangement-wise, harmonically. There's a cappella section, there's electronica, there's live drums, there's heaviness, there's glitch uh core sort of electronica there's mellotrons there's mini moogs there's guitar solos right. i mean basically just about everything that i could possibly think of i i put into it and from a, a thematic story point of view it serves as the as the pivot point if you will the fulcrum where um where effectively dora the character finally accepts uh, what's going on in her dream world and uh, and resolves to uh, when she goes back out into the real world do something about it yeah it's a great track and we're going to go ahead and lay it on them now
There's nothing here you can't recover I hope we meet again We saw ourselves in one another Until I see you then goodbye There's nothing here you can't recover
Okay, so once again, that was Rise Up Forgotten, Return Destroyed by Shineback. What year was that, 20. I think 13? it was 2013. Yeah, it, was the, right. it was the very first... I have to say, I've got to make, mention something. Um, it was the very first release by um, a, a label called Bad Elephant Bad Music. Bad Elephant. My buddy Martin Hutchinson now works for them. Indeed, yes. Uh, yeah. It's run by uh, by a gentleman called uh, David Elliott, who uh, started life um, as, a, as a sound man, funny enough, for, um, for, a, for a couple of, um, of UK progressive rock bands and literally toured the whole of the UK many, many times in the back of a beaten up old van. Um, and then, and then turned DJ. Uh, once the podcast revolution hit, he uh, started uh, his own podcast called the European perspective. And it was through that, that I met him. Um, and then he, uh, he started talking about the idea of forming a label because, uh, one of the great things about David is David's very much in the, uh, uh, in the, the idea of, putting artists before money and that's not to say that uh that he's uh he's a you know an old hippie and uh and and doesn't uh value the idea of turning a good profit but he does recognize that uh, for many many years artists have uh, have got a fairly lousy deal from the record deals that they've had to uh for sure to get contracted to yeah and so what he did is he uh he put together bad elephant music which was um a real genuine attempt to try and redress that balance, to give bands which might not necessarily um, find a home, um, and uh, and give them a chance to release material, and also a chance to make a, a genuine profit out of it as well. And uh, he has this great deal, which is effectively um, he will pay for the recording uh, of an album as long as it's within uh, a reasonable budget. He's not talking about going out into space and recording it on the moon or anything like that. <laughs> Um, but um, once uh, once the recording is done and everything has been released and and uh, the recording costs have been recouped, so to speak, he literally does split the profits fifty fifty between the label and the artist. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, and that's an incredible deal. And not many people, in fact, hardly anybody that I've ever spoken to have, have ever heard of that kind of deal before. Um, and uh, and we we came to an accord. Uh, he, uh, David and I, and he he sort of like said. I'd love to form a label. I said, well, look, I tell you what, I have this idea for an album, which was the first Shineback album. How about if I release that album through your label as the first release, you can make whatever mistakes you like <laughs> when it mm -hmm. comes to sort, you can sort out all of the, uh, the, the ideas behind the admin and stuff. You can, you can use this as a test, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and see how the label goes. And, uh, and we did it, and uh, the response was incredible. I mean, we, um, you know, it, it sold like hotcakes, and um, we, were, we were a little bit unprepared for it, and it but it really helped, uh, and I'm glad it did, help um, set David and the Bad Elephant label on course for the, uh, the success that they currently enjoy today. I think right, yeah. uh, they, re they released nine albums, last this year it's 2015 and i think they're set to release probably close to about 10 to 12 albums by different artists next year i keep seeing uh from martin uh, on prog radar he keeps announcing you know they signed this act they signed that act i've seen maybe three or four new acts being signed to the label in the last month or two so yeah it seems to uh be taking off and i'm really glad that that, that something like that can happen in this day and age I know it's it's a very rare thing to find. Um, you know, you 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 probably uh, you know you're probably looking at only a handful of labels around the world that are genuinely trying to um, to further the cause of, uh, of progressive music. I mean, probably uh, stateside. I suppose uh, Radiance is is one of the ones which uh, I uh, Radiant Records and maybe Ten T as well. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I could I could reel off a list of uh, of, of uh, European labels right. as well, but you've got uh, and uh, yeah, a couple others over there, right? Um, yeah, exactly. But they are thin on the ground. People who genuinely do want to uh, to put great uh, progressive music out there, and uh, and BEM Bad Elephant Music are definitely one of uh, amongst that number. Very cool. My name is Bond, James Bond, and I love the Malaysia rock music. That's 
wireless dog watch. It's marvelous. Your latest release is on Bad Elfin, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I released I, I've, I've released basically an album a year with Bad Elephant. I released Shine Back in 2013. I released an acoustic album um, called Motherland, which is much more song-based, and that right. was largely a a sort of postcard to to England, saying thank you very much for, for you know for looking after me all of those years, and uh, and it was just songs about saying goodbye to things it could be places it could be people it could be things you never know but um that was released in 2014 and and late uh, uh 2015 only a few weeks back i released what hopefully will be a uh, a series of, of of eps extended player um uh releases um black bag archive black, right the black bag archive yes yeah. and uh, and that um that was basically down to the fact that i had a, a massive backlog of material which never really found um, a home in any of the other projects I was working on. And uh, again, I approached David Elliott and said, look, I have all of this stuff. I'd like to release it. Would you be interested? And he said, well, let me have a listen to it. He gave it a listen and he came back to me and said, sure, we would love to release it. So hopefully um, we should be releasing something uh, every probably three or three to four months um maybe a six track ep every three to four months and uh the first one was released a couple of weeks ago cool very cool from that what do you like i i listened to it a couple of times i'm not super familiar with it at this point but i do remember uh thinking a few of them had a little more of that experimental shine back kind of quality to them a little little prog ear some of them yeah i mean i i would say probably the most representative of of of, of the batch on that is a track called into idle fury which is um, which was was uh, originally destined for the fourth Tiny Fish album, which would never came to light, um, and um, that's got a much more harder edge to it. It's um, it's got it's very jagged. It's got some sort of like nine inch nails kind of uh, feel in there, but it's also got this wonderful sort of like mellotron sort of like grandy or pomposity at the end, yeah. if you will. Which, um, which you know, it, a lot of these things are happy accidents, and I just happened to hit the wrong patch on a synthesizer, and I got this great grand Mellotron. I went, oh, that sounds nice. Awesome. So uh, so that's probably the track uh, that I would recommend uh, as, as a lead-off track if anybody ever wanted to listen to the, uh, the Black Bag Archive series. All right, well, we'll, we'll play that one here.
and I guess uh, probably why don't we talk a little bit about uh, coming to the United States, maybe? So you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've uh, you just moved to the United States a few years ago. What kind of culture shock do you have? <laughs> oh, it was it would uh, to be really honest with you, I suspect um, any American would have a very similar experience if they came to England, i.e. You kind of think you know what's going on until suddenly you realise you have no idea. What's going on. <laughs> um, crossing the street was uh, was a bit problematic for the first sort of like year. You're I was, looking the I wrong way, no, right? <laughs> yeah, I had no idea which direction the cars were coming from. As a result, I was like looking like a seven year old must look when they're crossing the road, and sort of like <laughs> I was constantly looking which way I was, you know, to, to each direction. In, in the hope that I was going to spot something bearing down upon me and not killing me. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but that was, it was, to be really honest with you, I've been really bowled over by the, you know, the the, the, the friendliness and the generosity of, of, of America. Um, as an Englishman, I think that the, the biggest shock to the system has been just the sheer size of the country. Um, it's just the idea that I, I went to San Diego uh, not too long ago, <laughs> and the idea of, sitting five hours in a plane traveling west and landing in the same country is a bit of a mind boggle for yeah. for the average Englishman, you know, travel 3,000 miles and, and do that. But so what I mean, England is probably about the size of Texas, right? Maybe. No, not no, even not that. There's actually a lake in, uh, in Canada that you can put the whole of the British Isles <laughs> in. It's that uh, there's a, there's a great, um, uh, a great, uh, fun fact that uh, I like to tell um, uh, America's, uh, uh, Americans about how small um, the United Kingdom is, is that you can stand anywhere um, in the UK and be within um, a day's uh, reach of the sea. It, even in the cent most central point of, uh, of the, uh, the UK, you are no more than 60 miles away from the sea. That's how yeah. small that island is. Yeah. Um, and uh, and when you when you arrive, when an Englishman arrives in the UK, or English woman, I should say, as well, um, arrives uh, from the UK to the US, just getting your head around the sheer scale of distance uh, and the size is 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 pretty mind boggling. And and but it's an exciting thing. Um, you know, I, I, I find myself sort of like almost with that kind of pioneer spirit. I want to leap into a car and just head west and see what I find. Sure. Yeah, I'm trying to see some parts of it. You know, we, my wife and I, we have a little bit of a bucket list. I recently got to see the southwest because my son was stationed in the Army down there. I don't know if I ever would have seen that, but I got to go to Carlsbad Caverns down in Arizona. You know, there's some really <laughs> neat things to see in the United States. Oh, yeah, and this is one of the other reasons why, sort of, you know, a lot of people uh, from from outside the states wonder why you hardly ever see any American tourists, and the reason being is that there's almost every kind of terrain that you can find in the rest of the world in the U.S. Right, but they don't have English pubs, you know. They, <laughs> <laughs> well, apart from pubs, it's on well, my bucket list to get to the United Kingdom someday. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I suppose it entirely depends on whether or not you like your your beer weak and gassy. If you do, then uh, maybe the uh, the UK is not the place for you. But uh, but there is certainly some great uh, drinking to be had in the US uh, in the UK. My wife particularly likes um, UK beer. Um, she's a big fan of UK beer, and so, so as a I. result, <laughs> trying to um, to pry pry her her hand free of a of a, of, a, of, a, of a pint mug. Is, is pretty difficult at times because she loves that stuff. Yeah, that's my favorite kind of stuff. Your pale ales and even some oh, of the yes. Scottish ales. Uh, love it. <laughs> Malty and uh, not not all this crazy super hops make your eyes bleed kind of, you know, like the craft <laughs> beer thing over here. It's like, let's see how much hops, you know, in typical American spirit. Let's see how excessive we can get. We'll try to make, the, you know, so your eyes water when you drink this. And the guys stand around making these faces saying, yeah, I like this. And it's like, no, you don't. It's like nobody likes the 1.5 million Scoville hot sauce either. No, it becomes a bit of like right. a, it's just there as a challenge. Yeah, it? yeah, it's a little bit of a, a measuring of something contest, which we won't mention for the general audience yes, here. Exactly. Yeah. Well, one of the other things <laughs> I would say is that uh, if you like the beer in in the UK, all you need to do is head off to Europe, and the beer suddenly gets am even more amazing in Europe. There's some um, uh, especially in Germany and Belgium. Yeah. The Netherlands, God, those people, they really know how to make their beer. 
Yeah, I've heard a quote that uh, Belgium's like the Disneyland of beer. <laughs> That's a great way of describing it. I'm a bit of a beer. I am a beer judge, actually, which I don't know if all the listeners here know. I, you act, There's an actual test you can take here in the United States, and it's not like sit in the bar and drink a bunch of beers. It's uh, When I took it, it was an essay test, and it was like three hours long, you know? Wow. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we, we judge beer competitions every year, and basically there's a set of guidelines that, you know, beers are supposed to adhere to. And uh, we judge them based on how closely they adhere to the classic model for that particular style of beer. So I am a bit of a beer aficionado, I guess. Um, so, yeah. I, so you like your beer like you like your music. Epic. Yes, exactly. I guess I'm just that kind of guy. The prog squats, you know, bigger than life. <laughs> I like bigger than life beer, bigger than life music. <laughs> I am the god of hellfire, and I bring you Voyage 35 Radio. Do you want to talk at all about uh, your brother at all? You know, I mean, what's that been like? You know, I mean, uh, well, I mean, to be really honest with you, it's 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 been great, really. To uh, you know, I mean, Gem and I have, uh, uh, you know, obviously we can't be that close now because we live in separate continents. But um, you know, Gem is um, an amazingly gifted. Um, keyboard player and uh, and writer and arranger producer he's, yeah, yeah I mean, and producer he's an astonishing on. he's an astonishing talent and um you know being my being my my younger brother i'm incredibly proud of of, of what he's achieved um in his world i mean he um he obviously has a um a day job being a producer as well and uh and i have to say if it's if if, if i was one thing that i would i would say um he does receive a little bit of criticism for not um producing more frost material but he has to keep the wolf from the door like us all and uh, the bills have to be paid and sure. as a result he um the poor the poor soul has to squeeze frost into all of the uh, the tiny little blitz of free time uh, that he possibly can and he has a large family as well to look after so uh, uh it 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 sometimes um um pains me to see him being criticized for for not being more prolific when He's doing absolutely the best he can with the time available, really. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. People are quick to criticize these days. Uh, I don't like some of the that type of stuff that I see going on, especially well, on social media or whatever. It's like, when, you, you know. When, uh, to be really honest with you, when you're a musician, you have to develop a thick skin because, you know. Sure. You, and you also have to believe that talk is cheap in, in that respect as well. You know, there, there are, people like to complain or at least certainly, certainly, uh, um, voice their opinions, I suppose. Is probably they certainly do like to do it. that. Yeah. But when you understand that it comes from a place of, of, of externalizing a thought, that's fine, really, at the end of the day. Just saying it doesn't necessarily make it so. Yeah. So uh, do you think you had an influence on him at all? Um, I t- you know, to be really honest with you, we we worked really only seriously together back during the sort of late 80s, early 90s in this band Freefall that we started in. And uh, we were, you know, we we wore our influences on our sleeves back then. We were uh, we were little sort of like, you know, progressive rock and heavy metal nuggets. So we'd like to imitate our our heroes. Jem has now gone beyond that. I'd like to think that uh, that I I have, and probably all of the other guys I've worked with have gone beyond that as well. And I, I think that Jem has, has created a sound of his own, which uh, you know, not many people have uh, have really come close to. Uh, uh, to equaling and uh, and I think he he really has sort of like found um, a niche which uh, which very few musicians can can really lay claim to. Amen. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Frost is just fantastic stuff, and I did a, a bit of that on a John Mitchell special. I did a, a little while ago. I'm a big fan of John Mitchell, also. Oh, John. I mean, yeah. and funny enough, John has just uh, has just uh, finished a a short tour in the UK. Yeah, the Lonely Robot the, stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, promoting the Lonely Robot album, and uh, and Jim was funny enough on stage guesting with uh, uh, with a couple of other sort of like uh, UK progressive stars um, uh, at the Scala in in London. Uh, from what I hear, I'd love to have been to that. I mean, if it's, if it's one of the things which I um, I miss most about being in the UK. It was it's experiencing the uh, the progressive rock scene there, which was it's incredibly um, um, vital over there. It's, yeah. uh, and I'm not to say that it isn't over here, but uh, again, going back to what we were talking about, the distances involved, I mean, uh, are, are are considerable. So as a result, the clans of progressive uh, of musicians and fans in the US really only get together at the festivals. 
yeah. like like you know uh, Rosfest and Nearfest as was and Prog Day and the like. So uh, that's when it comes together really in the US, as far as I can see. But in the UK, it seems like uh, everybody went up to see uh, Abel Gans and somebody else over the weekend. You know, there was a handful of bands that played, and yeah, there were there people was, going up from enough, London. Was, uh, and yeah, you, in the United States, it'd be like, well, if there was something going on in California, I couldn't exactly jump in my car no, and drive no. there. You know, but, but then again, that's one of the great things about the internet. The internet shrinks the world. I mean, it's uh, I mean, the very fact that you and I are talking right now, and we're we're not exactly ne- next door neighbors either, right. are we? When you think about it, I called into the uh, Progzilla Marathon a week or two ago and that was really cool i hung out with cliff and stacy for like three and a half hours here on you know through skype and it was you know nice and clear free i know, <laughs> you know? it's fantastic <laughs> I, do you know funny enough i was on that program as well i was actually singing a song and um i was halfway through it and uh uh dora uh my little greyhound um uh came downstairs and while i was actually performing live on air and placed <laughs> her little cold nose on the end of my my um my elbow unbeknownst to me and i almost <laughs> shrieked halfway through the song yeah. luckily i kept it together well i'm sure everyone would have forgiven you anyway um yeah <laughs> sitting there performing live from a, halfway around the world what a neat thing you know well as i said we you know it's uh we live in the 21st century now anthony and it's uh it's been all i'm waiting for now is my jetpack yeah yeah me too um have you ever thought about playing with any of your mates from back in England? Uh, I mean, with the internet, my last project, uh, actually, I I sent the tracks to the guitar player, and he worked on them at his house and sent me back tracks, you know, to pop into the final project. I mean, that, albums get done that way these days. Have you ever thought yeah. about that you might, you know, have one of your old mates guest on something? Or, you know, you said think- you keep the door open, but do you have any plans to do anything like that? Yeah, I think probably we, we, I uh, hopefully sometime next year once I've got a couple of other projects out the way um there will be the chance for me to finish complete and hopefully release um um the next Shineback album as well um which um uh, will hopefully um feature some of the musicians that were on the first Shineback album Matt Stevens from Fierce of the Dead ah yes um uh, um Henry Rogers uh, from Touchstone, uh, and uh, uh, you know, and there were other people like Deck Burke, who was also in in Frost and is in his own band and in a band called Audio Plastic now, and a couple of other artists as well, which I'd like to include, which I didn't have time to include the last time round. So yes, there is, there will definitely be an opportunity for us to reach across the Atlantic, so yes. to speak, and uh, and bring a and pull a few uh, UK artists over to this side of the pond. Thanks to the magic of the internet. Yeah, you got to love that, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I mean, when I think about what I was doing on reel-to-reel tapes, you know, 20, 25 years ago, and now what you can do on a computer, it's just amazing. Yeah, it's, you know, if I didn't know any better, I'd be pointing at it and calling it witchcraft, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's come a long way. But, uh, yeah, I guess maybe this is a good point to wrap things up. I, you know... We've covered a lot of ground. We've t- we've talked for a good forty minutes. I don't think I want to cut much of anything out of this. It's been so fun and informative. And uh, oh, well, thank you very much. I mean, the only one thing I will make mention to, uh, sure. to you is that um, the next project that, that I will be involved with uh, is hopefully the, the recording and the release of uh, of this album by uh, this new band Valdez, yeah. which uh, has, as I said, Joe Cardillo and Tom Hyatt. Um, so uh, that will be uh, uh, another uh, progressive uh, uh, rock album. So uh, hopefully, look for that uh, sometime over the summer of next year. Well, when when it's ready, uh, yeah, let me know. We're friends on Facebook now, so yeah, I'll Shoot be me delighted to, uh, to send me a to track again and when. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll put it on the show for sure. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate that. Hey, it's it's been great talking to you, and uh, I appreciate you soldiering on with the cold and all. Well, you know, it's been. I have to say that it has taken my mind off it. You know, I don't know whether or not you, uh, uh, you have this concept of man flu on this side of the Atlantic, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we get. I, I get the idea. I don't. I don't know how how much uh, my fellow Americans uh, know of it, but I have a lot of friends back over there on Facebook and whatnot. You know, so yeah. Well, you know, I've, I definitely have been uh, um, suffering a little bit today, but uh, fortunately uh, as i said this uh, this conversation anthony has really taken my mind off it so thank you very much <laughs> all right well thank you it's it's been a real pleasure 
Well, yeah. actually, there was one. Uh, there was one other thing that I wanted to mention you uh, to you. Sure. I completely forgot about it um, until now, which is uh, I, I also um, involved in a in a podcast called okay. uh, Tabletop Genesis, um, and that podcast um, basically is a, a round table discussion about all things Genesis. And what we do is Very we take cool. one album a week, a one album per episode, I should say. Uh, and we do a track by track analysis. We uh, we have a, a group of people that uh, that we, we sit around with, uh, uh, and it's hosted by uh, a gentleman called Mike Lord, who used to be the webmaster for the official Genesis website, and has actually hmm. interviewed the members of Genesis. And uh, we episode by episode we uh, we break down uh, uh, each of the uh, the albums track by track. And um, you can, if you're interested in anything genesis related we uh we we, t- we usually talk about it uh, in great depth over about an hour or a couple of hours Very and cool. uh, and you can you can download them um through itunes or you can listen directly but via streaming from uh, tabletopgenesis.com okay is that also on progzilla that is also indeed on progzilla that I was the reason so, yeah. why it reminded me yeah. is the fact that it, you released through progzilla yeah Hey, if you ever want another voice on that show, <laughs> you want to get the American. I'm, I'm a bit of a Genesis head here. I, oh, that yeah. would be great. Well, we're always we're, we're looking to get some guests actually in in in, in the uh, in the near future. We uh, we recently interviewed um, Steve Hackett. Awesome! I saw him just a few weeks ago here in Pittsburgh. Oh, cool! And I, saw well, I saw him last year too. Yeah, I, I saw him last year. I didn't get to meet him or anything, but uh, boy, what a show! You know, it's fantastic. Yeah, we, Mike Mike Lord's good mates with him, and so uh, we were able to. Um, we were able to sit down and uh, and actually do a proper sort of like forty five minute interview with him, which awesome. we're going to do. Uh, in, I think we're going to be releasing sometime in the new year. That's awesome. So I'd like to thank Simon once again for the interview material, and I'll just close with a few uh, of my usual things. If you like the show, you can like us on Facebook, Prog Hyphen Watch on Facebook, or follow me on Twitter at Prog Squatch. And also, please go check out the website. If you're at all interested in any of the back episodes, Season 1 is complete. Season 2 is about two-thirds of the way there. No, about a third of the way there. I'm sorry. And uh, Season 3, I'm trying to keep current as I release a podcast each week. I'm trying to make sure I add that to the site. So there are quite a few of uh, the past episodes there. Uh, if you're interested, progwatch.com. No hyphen or anything, all one word, progwatch.com. You can also email me, progsquatch, all one word, at gmail.com. And I will say to you, as I always do, prog on, brothers and sisters. But I'm going to let us ride out with another great song from Simon Godfrey. In his tiny fish years, the name of the song is Wide Awake at Midnight, and it's from their album, The Big Red Spark. So long, folks. Thanks for coming along.
think I'm lost inside your eyes. You pet me like a fool. Yeah. 